So I'm here to pay my respects to a teacher who just appeared and uh, kept supporting me till as long as he could. It is, uh, I, I can't recall the first time I met him. It's a shame, I can't rec really recall when I met him the first time. But it was much before I became a minister, that much I can say. And uh, I've benefited immensely by the articles that I've read of his in the Hindu business line. I hadn't noticed so much his writings in Hindu, but yes, Hindu business line. And I agree that he had written on so many different topics, which just makes you think that, uh, you know, if this is the kind of versatility with which he could write on an expanse of topics. He should have been a big, <coughs> immense, important member of any team in the bureaucracy. By talking with him and also by reading a few of his writings and also the memoir, I'm able to place the few important instances where, at whatever level he was in his uh, role as a bureaucrat, he had uh, sensed some developments and at least conveyed his thoughts. And as a result, you find a mind which was evolving in every one of the roles that he played. But wherever he was, he was, uh, as I say, heart and soul, body and mind and prana all together in the work that he was doing. And that is the reason I would think early in his career. Uh, I don't know whether it is Bharatpur or uh, Midnapur where he was posted. He was astonished to see more than 6,000 cases pending because as district uh, magistrate, they had a magisterial role to play as well, not just the district collector, but magisterial role. And he couldn't just believe 6,000 cases can be pending. And in his three to four year tenure in that place, he consciously maintained reducing the pendency as one of his uh, priority. And by the time he left the place for the next posting, the pendency had come down to a thousand only, which means at his own effort, he had cleared about a 5,000 odd cases. For a young officer, that must have been a bit of a rigor and bit of a monotony and uh, not glamorous at all, but that was the dedication with which he was from the beginning, that that's how he had to get going with delivering on his duty. And somewhere I think he also, Narini, please do correct me if I'm wrong, his early years, whether uh, as a bureaucrat, uh, late 50s and early 60s, were not easy because he had to keep his family with a salary, maintain the extended family with a salary, and there were times of running the household with a shoestring budget, and uh, he does record it somewhere, and uh, clearly it wasn't as if he was doing what he was doing because he had the comfort of taking care of his financials. No, he was hard up, but he didn't allow that to uh, you know, interfere in his efficiencies. I think after moving from his district postings, he's uh, held some of the very enviable positions. To be in uh, Home Ministry for nine years is not at all easy. And at a time when India was going through severe crisis, uh, I heard uh, Data talk about the challenges, whether it is the Meso Rebellion or the Chinese uh, or the Pakistani war and so on. And the uh, Bangladesh division, I think at that time he was posted elsewhere, but then having been in the Home Ministry, you see the intensity with which all this happens. And I think that is the reason why he somewhere de describes himself as he felt himself to be like a bee in a bottle, 
you know, desperately wanting to free himself from that and do something more constructive. So uh, moving to the center uh, and taking up main responsibilities was a very big attraction for him. And uh, at whatever level he was, I, I did mention this once before, at whatever level he was, he sensed certain collateral spiritual fall as a result of policy decisions. One such one was uh, probably for want of oversight or for due following of the statutory requirements, the implementation of the national language. He did highlight at whatever level, saying one shouldn't rush through this. It's important to be sensitive to it. And unfortunately, there was this push to implement it because the statutes required it to be implemented by a certain time. And naturally, it had its severe collaterals. There were a lot of protests. But Raghavan was somebody who knew the requirement to balance with political realities. And uh, it did see the fallout, which unfortunately others didn't see, but Raghavan did notice. And uh, I wouldn't be wrong if I labor on one point, which since then, since uh, the first Prime Minister's time till uh, 2016, I would say, when he had written about it once again, after so many decades, is that India should make a lot more attempt and effort to rid itself of the colonial baggage. He was very keen on that. He, in fact, felt that that was an opportunity missed out since the first prime minister, since after that as well, that we did not do enough to remove those colonial hangovers that were still bothering our administration, our systems, our uh, laws, our bureaucracy, and so on, that he, even in 2016, writes about it all over again, saying this is an important thing that we need to come out of it, we have to remove it. And for a bureaucrat who's in the system, going through the decision-making process, also to constantly keep feeling that in his mind, tells you that it is important for India to keep that on the agenda, whether you do it incre incrementally or do it faster, it is something which was very severely felt by Sir Raghavan. One other thing which uh, I've heard him speak to me on those one or two rare occasions is about the importance of technology and how it is necessary to bring in efficiency through technology. And in fact, he uh, probably mentioned it once to me and I've also read about it that the way in which technology is moving and the way in which it is being acceptable to people, how people are also adapting to it it will soon pose a question on issues like copyright, patents all those also will get you know, disrupted and we need systems to be ready to have the benefits of technology, but yet questions on copyright and other things may also come out. He has not elaborated it to me, but I later found that he had that kind of a thought as well on how technology is going to be important in our lives. And uh, he was quite savvy in the way in which he sent me messages using either the mail or WhatsApps or anything. And uh, at a personal level, in whichever, subsequent to my taking over, getting into the government, well, before that, as a spokesperson, he has given me immensely a lot of actionable advice. So did he when I was uh, first brought into the ministry. And uh, uh, I can't uh, really specifically uh, but narrate one uh, incident, so much in commerce, and then uh, when I moved over to defense, he did give me one clue of an advice, saying it's a ministry which has a lot of challenges, not just because the border and everything else, but 
the maintaining the harmony between the uniformed and the civil officers is something which you may think that I'm exaggerating, but no, that's a life problem. You'll have to be tuned to it. You'll have to maintain it. Harmony between the uh, uniformed service and the civilian is very important. And that's what you as a minister will have to keep in mind. It was a very vital advice he had given me after I entered the ministry, defense ministry. Uh, well, there are so many other things, of course, uh, we can speak about. But because his advices were more coming out of a wise head and with a heart which felt for India to move fast towards development, his uh, counsel was of use for most people who wanted it, irrespective of the political dispensation to which they belonged. Initially, I was quite surprised that he was, his advice was sought by most political parties in Tamil Nadu. I know Tamil Manila Congress, Mupanarji, the senior, had uh, you know, given him a lot of respect for his advice. And so was probably G.K. Vasan benefiting from it. So are the other political parties. I'm not naming each one of them, but every political party in Tamil Nadu. Maybe one or two exceptions, because I make a room for that. I don't want tomorrow, early morning, somebody to, oh no, finance minister was wrong. I'm not here as finance minister, but never mind. But she was wrong. My party has never taken advice from Mr. Radman. No disrespect for the ones who have gone away. But most political parties did think he had something to contribute to their party's ideology and thinking and how to serve the country. See, that is how versatile he was. There was no element of prejudice, no element of subjectivity, no element of you know putting his interests forward or no element of playing one against the other. He was fair-minded as a good matured, seasoned thinker, so he was acceptable for everybody for the kind of counsel he could give. It is uh, a big loss for all of us. I suddenly remembered much before I came here that Mark Twain probably said somewhere that it is in human nature to exaggerate the virtues of the dead. But here I can say, no exaggeration is enough of an exaggeration when you talk about Mr. Raghavan. He was a, a treasury of India's 60 years of attempt to stand up on its own as a democracy. The wonderful service which stands by as the bureaucracy, the steel frame, he represented the best of it. He had strong feelings on how this nation's bureaucracy can serve the country. He stood, as a, stood out as an exemplar. And that bee in a bottle which wanted freedom actually saw the freedom and was able to contribute even with that freedom is when he started writing in the papers. The columns that he's written, the edits that he wrote, the views that he expressed, and also the number of institutions where he had been associated with or as part of the advisory, or he himself founded, inclusive of the China Study Center in Chennai, are all remarkable reflection of that scholarship that he had. But he was like, as they say in Tamil, not very many saw that light, but those of us who saw the light really thought we can have more of it if we had the time or if we could bother him as, as many times as we could. So there's so much one can speak about him. He was a versatile person, generous to give, and on his own volunteered to support and advise and handhold. I'm an immense beneficiary of that. So with respects and uh, grateful to every one of you who spoke about him. So thank you very much for having me here. I extend my heartfelt gratitude 
to Mrs. Nirmala Sita Raman for sharing her perspectives on Mr. Raghavan's contributions to society. Thank you, ma'am, for also sharing with us your personal experiences and 